Today we are discussing Fortiv Corporation, ticker FTV. Over the next few minutes, I'll discuss my thoughts about the valuation of this company and its business quality. First up, they have a market cap of $23.3 billion, enterprise value of $24.8 billion. So you see about $1.5 billion of net debt on this business. Not a significant amount of debt on the overall business, but just a relatively low amount. You're operating in the machinery industry. The This company designs, develops, manufactures, and services, engineering products, software, and services worldwide. So... Looks like they have some brand names, Accruent, Flute, Gordian, Industrial Scientific, Inflex, Service Channel Brands. Has a pers- So a few different areas. So they offer you know, professional testing tools. They also have electrical test and measurement instruments. Um, they have Anderson, Nagel, Jim, Cetra, Qualitrol, Pacific Scientific, Tektronix. And they have another area called ASP, Census, Sensitrack, Evotech, Raysafe, and Stared Brands. So a lot of brand names. Um, this is a very dense uh, company here, but you can see it's a lot of testing solutions, engineering products, reliability tools, um, processing. So even in the healthcare solutions industry. So... Um, not a lot I can take away from the business description in terms of like whether the business is quality or not. A lot of it's going to come down to the economics. When I look at return on invested capital, though, if we ignore 2012, looks which looks like a you know a year of startup data or missing data, we can see data from 2013 to current day. You can see that in general the returns have kind of declined over time. 2013, you're at 32 percent return on invested capital. Even if you count 2014 at 17 percent, you're now down to five percent in 2021 and 20. 22. So overall, the returns have worsened over the last decade. Likewise, we see, you know, pretty decent gross profit margins, 52%, pretty decent EBIT and free cash flow margins that are similar, 19 and 18%. I'm good with those numbers. In fact, like over the 10-year median returns here, like I'm good with what I see here. 10-year is return on capital of 15%, return on equity 18%. All these numbers are really good. The problem becomes, I think, for me, is comparing this revenue growth, 0.1%, and the P.E. ratio of 30 don't match up. So you can have a no-growth company, but then the company needs to trade at a cheap price, like a P.E. of 8. Or if you have a high-growth company, you can justify a P.E. of 30, but we're not a high-growth company. When we look at this data here, it looks like they had a couple years of growth, 2013, 2014, 2015, but they've been declining since then. I mean, if you look across the whole decade, you had $5.9 billion in revenue. You end the decade at $5.8 billion in revenue. It didn't go anywhere. Um, likewise, you're, it's not like this was a change in share count or something that caused a big drop in shares. So your EPS went up a lot. That's not what we see here. Your EPS went from $2.41 to $1.63. Um, for whatever reason, it's not showing up in 2022. Maybe it was a zero number or this just data misprint. But like, you don't see any sort of like trend to explain like why this is happening. Um, your gross margins have improved over time. 48% to 57%. Gross profit's gone up from 2.8 billion to 3.3 billion. So you've seen your gross profit grow by 20 to 30% in the decade, despite your revenue being flat. So you have improved the overall like business of your gross profit. But despite that, your operating profit is actually down. So even though you're growing your gross profit, your operating profit's down. You're allowing your expenses to rise faster than your gross profit, which would be a concern on its own. Just with the numbers I have here, though, like my earnings are actually worse off today than they were before. I think these numbers aren't calculating properly. So we're going to have to do a deeper dive on the income statement and balance sheet. But overall, nothing super exciting here. I mean, I can't get excited about companies that aren't growing. And when you combine that with the, the return on invested capital getting worse over time, that's a major concern. It's okay sometimes if you have flat growth like no growth, but your return on invested capital is stable or growing because maybe you're pulling capital out of the business. That can be very exciting, but this is not an exciting thing that we're seeing so far, but we're going to need to learn a little bit more. If you're enjoying the video so far, if you're learning something, please hit that like button and I'm going to continue trying to add a lot of value. So you'll consider becoming my subscriber. Now income statement. Let's see what we can see here. You can see the cost of goods sold has gone down over time. And of course that's been the driver of your gross profit. It does have me a little bit concerned that 
what is causing that? Is this just material prices that are cyclical? So this could actually change over time. Is it something they're doing with their business? They've been able to use less resources. That would be a really good thing. You'd have to probably do a deeper dive on the business to understand what's driving that gross profit growth because they're obviously not getting it from the revenue. But your SGNA here has gone up 50%, and this is the concern. Your gross profit's growing 20 to 30%. You can't let your SGNA grow 50%. If that continues, your business is going to get worse and worse and worse in the future decades. And clearly, you can see here that something is just not calculating because they are still profitable. They've earned $755 million in the last year. You do have your shares outstanding here, 359. So you can see that they're earning you know, somewhere in that range of $2 per share. Um, pretty respectable numbers. The shares outstanding has gone up um, about what three, four, five percent. No, yeah, not a ton. You've gone up a few percent over the course of a decade. That's not a really major concern. Three forty-five to three fifty-nine. I'm not concerned about that level of dilution. Balance sheet. So I want to come down here to PP&E. You're not investing a lot in PP&E, but it looks like they've made some acquisitions. So your goodwill here is three point nine million. Is what 3.9 billion is what you start with the decade. Made some acquisitions in 2017, in 2018, in 2019, again in 2020. And you've seen this goodwill number go up. You've seen this intangible asset number go up. And that's what's driven the reduction in return on invested capital. That drives all of it because what you can see is that they're not putting the money into their PP&E. The business itself, the underlying net tangible assets isn't changing. What's changing for your total assets, the reason you've doubled your assets from $7.2 billion to $15 billion is driven almost entirely by the acquisitions that they've acquired in terms of your goodwill and intangibles. The downside is we're not seeing this impact on the bottom line or the top line, and that would be a concern for me. Now you have your long-term debt here, three to you know three four billion dollars, um, down to two billion dollars. So they've paid that down a little bit. Nothing impressive here. Cash flow statement. Um, So on the cash flow statement, we can see that they have some stock-based compensation here, which looks to be causing our dilution. Um, I don't really know why the machining company needs stock-based compensation, especially when they're not really getting much out of that stock-based compensation in terms of growing cash flow. Um, we don't see the growing cash flow you'd want to see. You can see the relatively low PP&E spending here, um, especially compared to depreciation and amortization. So this sort of depreciation and amortization should cause an overall decline in the balance sheet in terms of total assets once they kind of like bring down those numbers because of the higher, I mean, basically, you know, writing off some of these acquisitions over time. They're using less in terms of those assets. They're not having to reinvest in that as much as you can see with their cash flow spending. Um, here you see these acquisitions. They're spending the one and a half billion, two point seven billion, three point nine billion, two point five billion. You can see all these acquisitions. They're spending a lot more than their cash flow from operations is allowing them to do. And what's concerning to me is when we add up all these numbers, we've not really seen the impact we would want to see from this effort. One and a half, you know, two, three, four and a half, seven. I mean, you're seeing almost you know nine to ten billion dollars in acquisitions over the course of a decade. And yet the income statement doesn't show it. I mean, you're basically flat. So what did you spend your $9 billion on? Where did it go? I mean, you spent nine to $10 billion and that's half the market cap. Um, we've just not seen the returns from those efforts. So I have some concerns um, with the future profitability of the business. What this shows me overall in summary for this is this is an average business that's just kind of like floating water. They, they've already maxed out on their market cap in terms of you know their total adjustable market. There's not a lot of growth here. And without growth, businesses can really struggle to make good decisions. It's not necessarily a, a beat on the management at all. It's just like, if you don't have growth, then you're going to do stuff that can destroy shareholder value, like making acquisitions that are expensive. You think about that $9, $10 billion, that could have been a lot better used if it could have been returned to shareholders, something along those lines, instead of spending a lot of money, increasing the balance sheet such that now you have actually poor returns on your invested capital. If you could have just focused on having the return on invested capital from the business you had, maybe that would have resulted in a higher result. Now, perhaps the future is going to be better than this looks, but the overall last 10 years paint a pretty bleak picture for this business. I'm not interested in a business that's not growing. P 
period. I'm not interested in a business that's having worsening returns on capital. I'm not interested in a business that's trading at 30 times earnings without growth. So for overall, I'm going to pass on Fortiv Corporation. I hope you've learned something from this video. If you have, please hit that like button. Don't forget to subscribe. We're working through every company in SP 500. And my favorite ones are in the playlist at the top here. These are my watch list stocks. These are the ones that met all my criteria to be really interesting businesses. So I think you'll enjoy those videos. And if you would like to check out this software, it is quickfs.net. The first link in the description below is my affiliate link. Please consider using that link, signing up for a free or paid account. You can use the software yourself. It's really good at analyzing companies in 10 minutes or less. Thank you for listening. And until next time, stop paying fees, start building wealth.